Cool. Okay, so let's go on to the last thing I wanted to talk about, which is, since we got a pretty good group of people here right now chatting, I wanted to, and you can't really see, oh, it's, so it says he has six, but I felt like we had more than that. I asked this question on Twitter. Uh, and what I said was, uh, can anyone sum up what cloud native means in one sentence? Uh, and so I wanted to uh, get some opinions on this. What is cloud native? And I got some replies. Some of them were, uh, were, were sarcastic, <laughs> and some of them were... Uh, angry <laughs> and some of them were trying to actually answer the question uh quality coder says it means it runs natively on someone else's server <laughs> yeah so you're going with the very bare definition of what cloud means there so i wanted to go through some of these answers on twitter and uh and sort of uh see if we can see if we can suss this out so Sounds like a kludge of buzzwords to me. Yeah, exactly, Purple Primate. So I, I you know, buzzwords are kind of a, a blight on, uh, well, the world, I guess, but especially on the development world because people love to attach themselves to, to, to buzzwords and write blog posts and become consultants and start, you know, begin startups and... Uh, marketing materials all based around buzzwords to just try to get some more attention and, and ride that wave of attention and funding and whatever. So, but there's a whole cloud native foundation and things like this. So I'm like, what, do, what does that mean? Roy Kazak says that's a remote data center. Yeah, so there's a link to CNCF. What is cloud native? I've been to this page before and I'm still not really sure what it means. So this is what is a cloud native? Uh, what what is cloud native definition? And here it is. So definition all these different languages, but it, it's just it's just kind of like again it's buzzword soup. Cloud native technologies empower organizations to build and run scalable applications in modern dynamic environments, such as public, private, and hybrid clouds. Okay, what does that mean? Containers, service meshes, microservices, immutable infrastructure, and declarative APIs exemplify this approach. So enable loosely coupled systems that are resilient, manageable, and observable. Combined with robust automation, engineers, I bet, okay. Minimum toil. Yeah, we, people use a lot of the, use toil a lot. Okay, so these things are all fine, but what, I mean, if you go talk to any sort of IT group, they're going to say, yeah, we're, yeah, we're modern, sure. Uh, we're dynamic, yeah. We have our own public cloud or private cloud or we use hybrid cloud. Sure, yeah. Um, and these are examples of this approach. But you could say, oh, I'm, I don't use containers, but I'm cloud native. I don't use service message, but yeah, I'm cloud native. It seems pretty broad. Quality coder, I would expect that cloud native means it uses environment-based configs, not file paste, and overall just containers and load balancing. Okay, maybe, but environment-based configs, I mean, that's, that's kind of a really specific thing to say, oh, well, the Cloud Native Foundation, we're all about environment-based configs. That's not really something for, a, for an organization. Uh, loosely coupled systems that are resilient, manageable, and observable. So who defines what loosely coupled systems are? Like, there's no Cloud Native certification process or anything like that. So it seems like almost anyone could claim to be Cloud Native. Uh, any piece of software could claim this. Uh, this this definition doesn't really say what what is what do we consider not to be cloud native. Like what are the specific criteria for a piece of software or a enterprise or or whatever? And that's another part of it. What is cloud? Is it a piece of software? So uh, is ASP.NET cloud native, or is or is it more appropriate to say is Microsoft cloud native? Or can we say um, our, uh, our accounting application is cloud native, or is it more appropriate to say, um, the Acme widget company is cloud native or all of the above. So here's some of the answers I got on Twitter. I want to, I want to show these to you here. I got a pretty good a variety of answers. So Chase Oakwine, he says cloud native 
it's got what business business crave, <laughs> which is an idiocracy reference, which is him basically saying that, yeah, cloud native is just a buzzword, just to try to attach to something to get more attention, to just try to say, oh, yeah, it's cloud native, so it must be better. So if you're not cloud native, you need to buy our consulting services. And then here's Dan Yoko. Uh, just tagging on that. Adam Wright. Okay, so this is a this is a more of a uh, earnest answer. Writing apps that are meant to run in the cloud, probably utilizing cloud services like storage, messaging, functions, easier scalability. Okay, those are all good things. I think people couldn't couldn't argue those are not good things, but we got this probably in here. And what are cloud services? Does that mean the services that Amazon specifically offers? Or does it mean anything that I can run in Amazon, like on a VM, for instance? Or does it, or does it mean both? So if I, if I am locked into Amazon and I'm only using Amazon specific services, does that make me cloud native? Or if I'm doing like a lift and shift sort of thing, does that, and you know, whatever changes are involved there, do I now become a cloud native? Jim Borden, this is a coworker of mine. A cloud native is the politically correct term for an angel. <laughs> Another sarcastic answer. Thank you for that, Jim. I think that's funny. Keith, for, uh, I don't know who Keith is, but he said birds. <laughs> cloud natives are birds. That's where the birds live. They live in the clouds. All right, so Christopher Benage. It's designed to utilize the features of a cloud, i.e. past services, platform as a service, services, as opposed to being a port of an on-premises design. So Christopher is saying, it's not a lift and shift. Thank you for the follow, kick, kick, kicks. How are you? So it's not a lift and shift. So it's the next stage after lift and shift, maybe? Uh, and, and so what does that mean, next stage after lift and shift? Okay. Yeah, so he's, he's kind of giving me an, a little negative definition, designed to use features of a cloud, like platform as a service, services. Do I use Python? I don't use Python. I said this in the past. I, I, you know, I respect Python developers, and it's a totally fine language. I have uh, you know, nothing against people who use Python, but uh, the uh, significant white space, I just can't do it. I, my brain is not built for that. Uh, okay, so Inglorious, KTB, uh, so this is a Keith, I think. Uh, he says it's made to be distributed, accessible, scalable, out of the box. Okay. Well, what do you mean by scalable, I guess? Well, so distributed, yes. That's, that's tough to do without specific uh, designs, specific architectures to make something distributed. It's scalable, though, like uh, on Azure, I could just crank up vertical scaling all the way to use 300 cores or whatever their maximum is right now. Does that make it cloud native? I can just take my big ball of mud, throw it on there and scale it up to the roof and we're, we're scalable. Really, why do you think like that? Is it complicated? I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's complicated for me. It's hard for me. We're talking about Python again now. It's, it's, uh, it's hard for me to sort of deal with that. And it's not just about Python specifically. It's about any significant white space um, language, like YAML, for instance. Can't stand it. Because, you know, if I, you know, it just, I, it's just not the way I think, right? I, I don't, I think white space is there for making it easier to read, but when it's actually affecting the execution of the program, I just, I, I never, if I had started my first language at Python, maybe I'd think differently. But my first languages were, were, uh, were basic and uh, C++ and things where white space didn't really matter at all. Uh, so, you know, that's just the way I, I work. But lots of smart people are building great stuff with Python. So I don't want to tell you not to use it. It's just, it's not my thing. Uh, here's one, Calvin A. Allen. Building cloud apps, but natively. Thank you very much, Calvin, for the very thoughtful and useful answer. <laughs> James Hickey, of course, getting right to the point here, vendor lock-in. So I guess his point of view is, well, you got to be using, if you're on 
a cloud vendor, you got to be using uh, Amazon services. So you're locked into Amazon. Other people might say, well, there's lots of software out there that can work uh, multi-cloud. And some people say multi-cloud is silly to do that. So a uh, vendor lock-in. I mean, I don't think that's what the Cloud Native Foundation is talking about. That's not what they want, but uh, that's James Hickey seems to think it is. Michael Jolly, of course, here on, uh, he's one of my team members, so I'll shout him out. Uh, bald, bearded, builder. Shout out Michael Jolly. He says VB script. It's cloud native. Nope. <laughs> but I, you know, you could hypothetically again run VB script and ASP.NET Classic app, run that on uh, one of the clouds. Who's to say it's not cloud native? Ben Lackey. This is a former coworker of mine. Doesn't really follow the rules here. He uses more than one sentence, but he says multi-tenant SaaS that scales automatically doesn't expose the end user to IAS, IAS, Core's RAM network disk. So that's two sentences. Where to the three examples include BigQuery, Lambda, Twilio, and Salesforce. Okay, uh, so, so here's the thing. I know Ben personally, and I know that he knows cloud tech really well. He is super sharp about this stuff. But this, this definition, I'm not sure that a lot of people are on the same page as him. Uh, he's saying multi-tenant SaaS that scales automatically doesn't expose user to infrastructure as a service. So I don't have to worry about my cores and RAM, stuff like that. But just up here, we've got Christopher Bennett saying utilizing PaaS services. So we've got, is it SaaS? Is it PaaS? What is it? Oh, CBD Gamer giving us another opinion. Cloud native systems are designed to embrace rapid change, large scale, and resilience. That's such a vague definition, though. Uh, I mean, that, that's that's almost like a mission statement. It's not what some, It's not defining something. It says we want our software to be to embrace rapid change. Sure, who doesn't? We want it to be large scale. Sure, who doesn't? And we want it to be resilient. Yeah, sure, who doesn't? But the cloud doesn't, by default, guarantee resilience. It still takes the developers and DevOps team to make resilient scaling. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is kind of what I'm getting at, TBD Gamer. This is a really good way of expressing it. That it's not something you can just, oh, well, we're cloud native now, so uh, everything works and can scale, and it's perfect, and it's great. No, not at all. <laughs> you still need to make it work. Here's an answer from Nathan Smith, a former coworker of mine, says, hmm, not sure on that one. I think this is probably the most accurate answer of them all. <laughs> okay, then we get down here to uh, upside down Bill Landers, who says, glorified shell scripts in languages nobody will remember in 36 months that only work on one brand of hosts and fail often, but theoretically could scale to infinity if you had enough money to buy twice as many computers as it would take to do an on-prem but low upfront cost. Sounds like Bill. Yes, exactly. Bill has been hurt. <laughs> I think he's referring to Kubernetes, maybe? Uh, or maybe uh, like some Terraform sort of thing. Languages nobody will remember in 36 months. Maybe he's referring to YAML there. Uh, I don't know. Um, but yes, Bill definitely has been hurt. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but there, there definitely is, again, this is kind of the, I think people are, are adverse to buzzwords. All right, Dave Starling. This is not a coworker of mine, but I've worked with him in the past. Uh, his company has done some really cool stuff with Couchbase. I th well, his former company, anyway. I think he moved on to something else. But he says, assume everything will die, <laughs> which is a pretty maudlin point of view. And then this is another former coworker of mine saying, yes, be failure ready. So... I like, I like this. I don't know if it really speaks to the whole cloud native buzzword thing, but I, I like this and that this is a good attitude to have when building stuff for the cloud as just uh, when, like a microservices approach because uh, you have like dozens of services, let's say, and they're communi communicating to each other over the network, probably HTTP or something like that. What happens if one of those services dies? Well, uh, if we've built our system in such a way that it's sort of tightly coupled to it, 
well, then our whole system dies. And that's not what we want. We want to have an architecture that's going to be able to withstand uh, some part of it going down for whether it's a few seconds or a few hours or a few days, um, enough time for us to get it back up and running, whether that's automated, automated or manually. So yeah, this is sort of the chaos monkey approach that Netflix would take is that, well, let's just poke holes in our system and uh, see what breaks and uh, then figure out, well, how do we rebuild this or architect it so that if it does, if this happens again, that our system will, will still be as resilient as possible. And there's actually a presentation I give about this uh, called, uh, I'll bring it up here. And this is, I say it's, I give it the presentation. I am absolutely not the one who who did a lot of the work on this, but it's a session called Autonomous Microservices. And it's about uh, building microservices in a way that uh, they can withstand this kind of damage. So cloud native is a goal. You know, I, I think... I think that's that makes sense to me. It is a goal, yes. But I think that's the way we should think of it as a goal, which is the way things is Dave and, and Laurent are are saying. And uh others I think have said something similarly. Like uh well, this is this is out of the box, right? Um using like features of the cloud, things like that. Um but I, th I think the danger here is when, when you have vendors or open source projects or whoever saying, um, if you use this software, you, that makes you cloud native. Or uh, our software is cloud native. I think those statements don't really have a lot of meaning to them. And I think, I think TBD Gamer is right. I think Dave Starling and Laurent are on the right track here. It is a goal. It is something we want to be able to make our software architecture run in the cloud and be able to withstand anything that goes wrong uh, in the various systems. But, I mean, I guess my only concern there is, is we're talking cloud specifically. And I could, I could design these systems to assume they would all die, and do that in a local data center. So what's the, what's the cloud part there? All right. We could assume my local data center will die. Maybe I have a, a second data center. I have multi data centers. Uh, or maybe we maybe the cloud uh, platform goes down. It has happened in the past. Azure data centers go down. Amazon data centers go down. These things could happen as well. So what's my backup plan for that? So I, I'm still not sure we've got 100% nailed down definition, but I'm, I think it's important to have this conversation to get it out there because it's a term I keep seeing pop up and it's starting to get into that portion of the, of the hype cycle where it's just getting mashed up into a meaningless buzzword that everyone will throw up on their website or throw up on their, their advertising, their signage. And it's just, okay, what are we even talking about anymore? And this is what happens to all buzzwords. I think in the tech world, uh, we've talked no sequel, serverless, um, uh, whatever else, um, digital transformation, uh, data lake, all these, all these sorts of words, they get, they, they are have such a broad meaning that they become meaningless. So I think it's important to have this discussion and to, to have this discussion about buzzwords in the future as well. So whenever you see a new buzzword come down, let's just stop and think for a second, what does this actually mean? What are we trying to communicate here? Why are we using this word in the first place? And let's let's drill down and get the deeper meaning behind the term so that we can get on the same page and not just throw buzzwords at each other.